Hi, I'm Desiree Chapel. Welcome to Top Med Talk. It's Tuesday and it's time for my round table. The round table is a chance to sit down with a multidisciplinary group to have discussion about perioperative care and improving the quality of what we do every day. Top Med Talk. Hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. I'm Desiree Chapel, host and managing editor of Top Med Talk, and I'm joined by Monty Mythen, our editor in chief. Hello, Monty. Hey, Desiree. Our guest that we have with us, Ross Carriage from Australia. Ross, how are you? Well done, Desiree. He was the father of perioperative medicine. He's now the grandfather, grandfather of perioperative <laughs> medicine. <laughs> Let's get it going there. <laughs> so, Ross, you've been involved with perioperative medicine for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, um, we have Lee Fleischer, who's a friend of Top Med Talk. With us today. Hi, Lee. How are you? Fantastic. It's sort of funny because I still remember coming here and Monty's there presenting ERAS and we would have Henrik Kellett come. And, you know, about two years ago in the U.S., in, in my institution, we had like a champion that we've been doing it for three, four years. <laughs> this is the way we got to go. You know, I discovered it myself in ERAS, and I'm like, well, I've been trying to talk about ERAS <laughs> since Monty invited me over in, in 2007. And it's like, okay, now, how long is it going to take for prehab to be accepted in the U.S.? Oh. It'll go, it'll be the next big thing. The someone, next someone, big thing. Someone said, next year, that'll be the word of the year. Yeah, the, in the yeah. Oxford Dictionary, I presume. Does Webster's do that as well? Uh, Webster, uh, Webster, do, yeah. Do they you know. have the word of the year? Yeah. yeah, yeah, well, yeah. It, it and was, you can see that. It was yeah. funny because I was at the Joint Commission, which is our large accrediting body, just uh, <clears throat> seven days ago. And I said prehab, and about half the room like shook their heads, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other half of the room said, can you explain that? Yeah. yeah. And if you type in, the key question is if you type in prehab, does the autocorrect automatically <laughs> type change it to rehab? And so far, it still it does. It still does that. <laughs> so I think we will know we've made it yeah. when we don't get it autocorrected. <laughs> we all had to add it to our dictionary. Okay, so JAMA Surgery, I think that's predominantly a U.S. journal, is that yes, correct? Yes, it is. Publishing the Guidelines for Perioperative Care in Cardiac Surgery, May the 4th, 2019. Yeah. And if you look down the list of evidence-based recommendations about number 12 down is prehabilitation for patients undergoing elective surgery with multiple comorbidities or significant deconditioning yeah, yeah. but I it's think number Ross 12 right. boom well no but it's only in, in order of you know the okay. logical order <laughs> it's, it's not it's not the ranking of evidence yeah but it's on the, it's on a short list yeah. and it, it says awesome. prehabilitation yeah well, from being on the ground too and hearing a lot of this being in the space I mean I feel like enhanced recovery it's it is a huge undertaking, and you have so many people you have to touch, and it, there's a lot of processing thing. And I think that prehabilitation is similar, but some of those things are already in place. You know, it's just getting them all together in the same, you know, teams doing it. And uh, you're also engaging the patient a lot more than you are with enhanced. I mean, it's all the same, but you're getting to the patient earlier to engage with them instead of just right at the, the point of contact with enhanced recovery yep. for a lot of places. Yep. So. And it is very much a patient-centered thing. Absolutely, and, yeah. I, and I think we've probably all had the experience with a patient who you have turned their life around. Yeah. I, had, I had a patient only a few months ago who came in and she said, you don't recognize me, do you? And I didn't. And I'd seen her about 14 months ago and, you know, obesity. And she, she said she'd walked out swearing really strong <laughs> Australian expletives at me. Um, but came back 14 months later, she'd lost 90 kilos, oh. had totally turned her life around, was turning her family's life around. And she said, that night I went home and thought about what you said and it's changed my life. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it, and it is, it's so engaging for the patients and they, they really want, want to change uh, and, you know, and have now the opportunity of somebody to guide them to do it. So I, I think it's fantastic. But you know what? What we need to do, and I don't know in the U.K., but in the U.S., we have a very limited number of geriatricians who sort yeah. of get this. Yep, same here. And we need the GPs and the internists to begin to understand. And, and I think, you know, that will be uh, the key question is can we get them? ERAS... You know, the, the hospitals are looking at this as a financial potential benefit. 
but we really need the specialist to take up this. Particularly with the people who are most likely to gain are that yeah. top 5% that we've been talking to here, the ones who are the frail on the top edge of the age range and frailty, and that's where only small amounts of programs, not getting them on bikes for half an hour, but even just walking up and down the corridors yeah. makes differences even in cognition as well as their physical. But as you listen to habits. Franco Carly, you know, yeah. you, we, we have to do the prehab with the nutrition. Yep. It's not simple. Well, it's a very synergistic. I mean, a lot of the, the a lot of what he's talking, you know, what he's talking about. And but I think a lot of people have made a lot of significant strides with prehabilitation and not doing all those pieces together. So, starting where you can. I think yep. the I mean, we had the launch this week of the Macmillan endeavor yeah. Yeah. about prehabilitation in the context of cancer. Now, I was at one of the first working groups for that about 10 years ago, and the conclusion of it was that the cancer practitioners had to go away and re-educate each other first because when they did a sort of survey of the relevant relative impact of nutrition and exercise they still had a majority of practitioners who were giving out advice that suggested that you're better off to take to the sofa and look after yourself and eat what you want and go to bed and huddle up under the duvet and and it, it's taken that period of time to re-educate the practitioners I think to be ready to have a campaign because if we as clinicians don't get it yeah. it's going to be hard to share it with our patients but, but you know i'm not sure it, it even needs to go through the clinical venue i mean what would be ideal you know for the brain health work that we've talked about in the past is can we get the associations aarp which is our re- uh, agree but my, my point was if you then go to your doc who says no hang on a second don't overstress yourself mm-hmm. you know you must you must rest more which was what was seen to be happening at the time, you're going to get confusion. Whereas if we all now say moving is important and exercise is important, nutrition is important, then absolutely I agree with you. The avenues are, are the general public. Yeah. So um, we were having a conversation a, a little bit earlier about some things that you've been presenting recently on um, age... So w- what's happened? This age-friendly hospital. Age-friendly hospital. That's what it is. So in the U.S., there's something called the Hartford Foundation, which is a group that funds care for older adults. We can't say the silver tsunami anymore because tsunami has a negative connotation in the United States. Oh, I, th- I thought silver had a negative connotation. <laughs> no offense, Silver's Mommy. a good thing. <laughs> it is a good thing. Got lots and, of them myself. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so... They have um, teamed up with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and with the American Geriatric Society and now the American Hospital Association Joint Commission to say, you know, when you are older adult and, and Monty in our prior discussions, you know, yes, our, we should be pediatric friendly and we should be the uh, middle age crisis <laughs> friendly. And, but Sign our older mm-hmm. adults really are, are having a lot of the complications. Yeah. And the question is the huge amount of delirium we see, yes. the huge amount of deconditioning, the huge amount of confusion. So can we make our hospitals friendlier for older adults? So they came up with the four M's, which is let's make sure they're on the right medications, let's make sure they have mobility, let's make sure their mentation is maintained, and lastly, let's find out what matters. So in this shared decision-making world, it, it's not saying let's do shared decision-making, but really let's understand before they even get to the hospital what matters to them so that we can focus on those long-term goals. So that's the question will be, can we transition and make sure our hospitals implement some protocols for the older adult to just check on those few things? We, I don't know in the UK or Australia, we have a perverse uh, incentive that when patients come to the hospitals, they get checked for falls risk. Yes. Yeah. And, it's, and they get measured for falls and falls with injury. And in the US, everyone believes that if they have falls with injury, that they're going to get this huge black mark, yep. which is true, falls with injury. But they also extrapolate that because we still measure it with falls. Now, do you want to take a patient, you're an intensivist, yep. do you want to walk them, but they may go to knee, and therefore you have to say they had a fall, 
or do you want to keep them moving as long as they don't get injured? So I don't know what's happening in, in other uh, areas. I, I think both in hospitals and in aged care institutions and just the aged care environment generally, the issues around falls is inducing a whole lot of inappropriate behaviours mm. of keeping people sitting down, avoiding them moving, you know, using chairs, using walking frames, when in the overall scheme of things, most of the time they'd be better being exercised, being allowed to exercise, being encouraged to exercise. Uh, I mean, but it's not happening. It almost feeds into the prehabilitation. Yeah. I mean, oh, if totally. you get them moving before, when they come in, you can keep them moving better. Yeah. Yeah. Mustn't wrap them in too much cotton wool. No. <laughs> I, I must Can't admit, problem. with the age-friendly hospital, Lee, which I think it's great that America's coming up with this, but uh, it struck me for some time that in the paediatric section of our hospital we have, we have family is encouraged to visit at all times, then you have the local sports stars and yeah. media personalities and volunteers and hospital fairies and clowns and all sorts <laughs> of people coming in to keep the kids happy. And yep. I think some of the kids must go home exhausted from <laughs> having to deal with all these the people there to keep them happy. <laughs> yeah. And literally up in the elderly wards, we have people dying of loneliness. Yeah. You send, you send the kids up to the... To the yeah, to the or the cl- clown doctors and see if anyone notices. <laughs> Get them in the same space. <laughs> but, you know, well, it's it's a, that's a fantastic point, uh, uh, Ross, because I, I mean, I really feel like it's forgotten. I mean, and I think in the U.S., the trend with having nursing homes and, you know, there are... There, there are a lot of lonely people out there. We're not yep. taking care of them in all the different places. I know that's a bit of an aside, but that's what makes me well, think of that. Well, it's interesting. We've hired in our own hospital nursing students. Mm-hmm. Either I don't know if they're hired or they're volunteers. Like to come internships. In and yeah. just talk with yes. the older patients, help yeah. them around. Sir so Norman Foster is building a, a, designed our new hospital. Oh. So... Yeah. The angel of the north. Is that right? Yeah. So it's, it's going to be funny in that my understanding is we're going to have Apple TVs in, in all the places. So the question is, can you, you know, go talk to your friends and family via your Apple TV? Oh, like FaceTiming. Yeah. Yeah, FaceTiming people. Huh, hmm. that's really interesting. I don't know. I mean, I think it's um, it, it's one of those things where I, I, I think we, sh- we should be doing all of these things anyway. Really, I mean, with you know that considering the eight different ages, I mean, I think some of the things that we do in in enhanced recovery and perioperative medicine, I mean, we are addressing those things. Um, Ross, I mean, what are you guys doing in Australia now? I mean, as far as this goes, as far as aged care, yeah. there is a royal commission which is the equivalent of presidential commission in the US. I'm not sure. Do they have royal commissions in Britain yeah, when you're not one. talking about Brexit? <laughs> but, we do. But, but no, no, no. There, there's it's a, it's a very hot topic at yeah. the moment. A royal commission into aged care and nursing homes, um, and so there is a big community concern about what's going on uh, in this sector and care for the aged. But uh, hopefully, there will be some good things come out of it. Well, you know, we're all um, involved in anesthesia as our background, and the question mm-hmm. is. Traditionally, we've never been involved in that outreach mm. yeah. before the patient comes to the hospital other than, hey, you may come to a pre-op clinic. Yeah. And I think uh, here in the UK, you certainly are getting more engaged with Monty and Michael and Denny and others' leadership. So the question becomes, what should our role in making sure the patients are informed? I saw what the Royal College is doing with the videos. I mean, mm. how do we make it that patients are, you know, they're starting to talk to their GP, let alone their surgeon, mm. and get them informed about what they can do to get themselves ready. Yep. I, I think there's the mood music is if our National Health Service is going to survive, which we all hope it will and thrive, we've got to do more caring and less clever, mm. is, the, is the sort of strap line at the moment, because the caring bit, particularly the care of the elderly, and yeah. keeping them safe and secure is part of that's the core of society and if it's going to be a national health service that has to be a priority well and, and you may know in the u.s the democratic candidates are talking about medicare for all which essentially is the nhs yeah and you should be able to do it because we keep referring to this you spend more out of your gdp on health care 
as your equivalent of an NHS embedded in your total spend than we right. do. You, you've shown us that data before, Lee. Yeah. You're actually, your tax expenditure on healthcare is a higher percentage of GDP than ours. Absolutely. So you're already spending the money. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ross, I have I, a question. I think we better wind up I, I know, war here. I know. I, <laughs> I'm just well, not a war. It's, it's, it's good news. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, we haven't had many people from Australia that we've interviewed and heard, heard much about what the healthcare system looks like down there. So just as a contrast, or maybe similar, um, what, what is the typical, I mean, what does it look like there? I'm sure it's like everywhere else, uh, yeah? We have a real mishmash because... Uh, there's a very active private sector. Uh, so 70% of surgery is done in, in private hospitals uh, in, in Australia, uh, much less in New Zealand. New Zealand is more comparable uh, to the NHS. Uh, but in Australia, we, we in fact have eight different health systems because it's all state-based. Uh, the community health care is federally based. So the federal government pays general practitioners. Uh, the state governments pay the hospitals. The, the state hospitals um, and they're all different um, yeah. uh, so it's a very confused system but seems to work nevertheless we get good results I say you guys uh, have great we results have problems there. and we have challenges and we have huge opportunities as well uh, but I think we can all learn from each other and one of the great things that I've found over the years in my long time in <laughs> oh, medicine, Ross, you know thank it. you, Desiree. <laughs> uh, but I think one of the really exciting things is travelling around in, in my main country, Canada, the US, uh, Britain, of course, uh, Europe a bit, uh, Scandinavia, uh, parts of Asia. Uh, all these different systems, but everyone's coming to the same conclusion that ultimately the process works and the process... The, the model of care that we're coming up with of very structured early preoperative assessment, preparation systems, prehabilitation and structured recovery, whether you call it enhanced recovery or whatever, uh, it all makes sense. And it, the answer is the same no matter which, where the question's coming from. But yeah. in that's that a really context, exciting thing. It is. In really that exciting. context, we actually have to give an homage to Monty and, and Mike and, and Mark Yep. The founding fathers of EPOM, because yep. this was has been the place where a lot of different the thought have been uh, individuals yeah. have correct, yeah. and yeah. we've taken them back, and uh, we do some variation, bring it back here, and and get critiqued. Well, <laughs> I get critiqued. Yeah. Well, I love That's it. That's a I good mean, thing. It's it always good to critique you, Lee. Uh, yeah. I feel like I'm sitting here with like the, the giants of perioperative medicine. It's really cool. Thank you guys very much. And thanks for everything that you all have done. Monty, you have a point. Uh, just uh, on homages, uh-huh. um, tomorrow night I think there's an expedition going on in the evening, <laughs> which, yeah. which, which, yes. en- which, which I think ends, ends at a public house we visited before as part of the expeditions in London, which is the John Snow. Yes. Oh. He's an interesting character. It, I think, uh, I know if he's born, but basically this is his patch, Jon Snow, if you look up. just We're just on the, next to uh, Russell Square here, and he was yeah. at UCL for a while. Uh, well, but, he was... He was a graduate from the Newcastle Medical School. There we go. I Look knew it. Newcastle on time, not Newcastle in Australia. Yeah. I think he did his later work down yeah. here somewhere. Yeah, and then he came down here and, uh, you know, Epidemiology. Was the father of public health and the father of anaesthesia. Wrote the first anaesthesia textbook. And we're going over to to have a look at yep. the public house called the John Snow, which is next to the the pump, the pump, the pump, which is now on Broad, Broad Street. That was Broadwick, was it Broadwick? No, 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 no the other Broad. way around. It was okay. Broad Street. And it's now called Broadwick Street. So, there do we, we have know. time to say what the pump is? Yeah. Because a lot of people, thank you for saying who Jon Snow is, because there are a lot of our listeners that yep. may not yep. know. May think it's <laughs> yeah. Game of yeah. Thrones. Yeah, there is another Jon Snow, I gather. No, well, in 1850-something or other, there was an outbreak of cholera in Soho, and Jon Snow was the one that realised that the common source was this one of the pumps, one of the water pumps, uh, in what was then Broad Street, now Broadwick Street. Um but not only did the science, but got on to the people who had power, particularly the local vicar, I think, to force the authorities to take the handle off the pump. So oh. thereby saying, look, rather than putting a sign up saying, drink this water at your risk or whatever, said, no, the government's got to step in and take the handle off the pump. And I thought we were um, going to have to look, there's a more complex story there related to a local brewery and people drinking 
light light beer as an alternative to the pump water and him mapping out the various outbreaks. Oh, the, we'll the, go into that tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> next time, next ready. time. We're on very thin ice. <laughs> <there. Yeah. laughs> okay. Well, on that note, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for everything that you're doing for evidence-based perioperative medicine and to move the needle um, in the world because all of you have very strong voices and I think it's, it's pretty awesome. So thank you very much. And thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. We'll catch you next time. Cheers. Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here. On August the 11th, 12th and 13th, the American Association of Nurse Anaesthetists will be holding their annual congress. Top Med Talk will be coming to you with live updates from the meeting as it happens. We will be interviewing thought leaders, academics and prominent practitioners for three days of discussion and debate. The opioid crisis, enhanced recovery, innovations in anaesthesia and much, much more. Guests will include the president of the AA&A, Gary Bridges, Lynn Reed, and Lorraine Jordan, to name but a few. To get ahead of the curve, why not listen to some of last year's podcasts from the AA&A? Simply go to topmedtalk.com and type into the search engine AA&A. Pop that in and you will find our output from last year. In the meantime, of course, if you want to find out more, the American Association of Nurse Anaesthetists are holding their annual congress August the 11th through till the 13th. Go to topmedtalk.com for more details. And while you're there, make sure you subscribe to Top Med Talk. And of course, you've joined us on social media. That's topmedtalk.com.